Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Visual South Library. It has become a mainstay in the community for community events, transmitting information, educating our children, providing anything that you want to be done. So we're having this tribute celebration of Black History Month in this facility. Let's give the staff of this facility a round of applause. And we want to move judiciously, expeditiously, through our program agenda tonight. But I want to first offer a couple of housekeeping notes. There are certificates to be signed by every member in attendance tonight. They're up front. So throughout the evening, uh, once we get done with the program, please come up, sign them, let some people know that we have love, appreciation for them. Uh, that would be so kind. Our program this evening is to celebrate elders. Webster defines elders as anyone who has gained wisdom, statue, and then most, most importantly, an understanding of the community in which they live. We feel that the Black History Recognition Program would not be worthy to be called a Black History Program unless we recognize our elders. Keep in mind that this is the first step in organizing, planning, and implementing a community-wide Black History Month program in the future. So stick with us as we plan it and put it together. We're going to open our program this evening uh, with a welcome and the occasion by Port Fiber. We really do welcome you all here. We can say that in English or Swahili, Karibuni Sana. Um, and we're just excited to have another Black History Month activity here and to be here at our beloved South Madison Library. So we're just going to go right into the program. We're going to introduce Mrs. Um, Edith Lawrence Hilliard and the Precious Memories Choir. But again, thank you all for coming. The uh, Precious Memory Choir started with a conversation last March. A group of us were at the annual um, Carter, Solomon Carter Fuller Brain health brunch. I had to write that down. That's a mouthful. And anyway, we had this conversation at our table because they were having a choir come, and the choir was coming from Milwaukee. And as we were sitting there, we were talking and saying, why would they bring a choir all the way from Milwaukee with all of the choirs that they have here in Madison? So we were just kind of mm, a little upset about that. And so, and so as we talked, the choir came up, and they introduced themselves, and they are a very unique choir. Uh, the people in the choir uh, had uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, and there were caretakers. And there is no such choir like that in Madison until now. And so then we decided, several of us, myself and Karitha Cash, decided that we would start this choir. And so I will invite the choir members to come up now. Beautiful, beautiful. Also, Anne Stefano, this is, this is a, you know, human error, so... All those communities, so let's all help us here and sing this song. Again, we sing first verse, lift every voice and sing. So everyone, if you please stand. All right, here we go. If you, if you can, I'm sorry, if you can. Sing. All right, here we go. Lift every voice and sing. Oh, my 
Precious uh, Memories Choir. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Brown. I'm the um, choral director of this. And um, we're going to sing the song. It's uh, called Precious Memories. And uh, it's something that, you know, it's a no song, but it, it feels dear to the hearts of those, you know, who have uh, marriage. And we also want to add that anybody knows anybody that um, has a, um, any memory issues, dementia, Alzheimer's, etc. Please, please, or caregivers, anybody, anyway, please, uh, you know, join us in, um, you know, in making this choir a little bigger and stuff. You know, we're, you know, we're, we're small right now, but hopefully, you know, we continue to grow as we go, go on. So here we go, precious members.
you need I guess I'll need the mic. Ah, okay. It's my pleasure this evening to interview Sarah Wells, and her daughter Mary Wells is here. And uh, I'm not interviewing Mary, but she's allowed to add into her mom's stories. We're so glad you guys decided to stay in Madison. Yeah. Let's start off with your memory of coming to Madison in 1948. What do you remember? Well, some time ago. <laughs> uh, I came here in 1948 from Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, my mother was living here before I got here. I was living with my sister in Youngstown, Ohio. <clears throat> Youngstown, Ohio with my sister and brother-in-law for a while. And my mother came here twice. So mother got a job on the campus, cook as a cook, and she wanted me to come. And so I had to come. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, we stayed there on the campus at 130 Langland Street. And uh, the house of mother was Mrs. Halpern. And we lived, stayed there for about two years. And I was going to Central, and I couldn't keep up my school and get up early in the morning and prepare the meals, help mom, and all that. So I had to quit school. And uh, they kept me after school. And I told them I can't do that. So they thought I was terrible. Because <laughs> I walked out. <laughs> So I told him I just couldn't handle it, so I had to quit. So anyway, um, ended up living, mom stayed on the job for a while, and then we ended up moved to, uh, I think it was 730, Amy Bob Jones's home on Mound Street. I think it was 713, I'm not quite sure. And we uh, stayed there for a while. And I can remember the days how we go down on West Washington Avenue, they had the neighborhood center down there. And uh, I, you walked all the way from Langdon Street down there. We, we no. did. Who was with you? My sister, mm -hmm. Ruby. <laughs> Everybody called her Mickey, but I always called her Ruby. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't have no transportation, so we walked. We didn't think nothing about it. Mm -hmm. Did they and, have buses that came? Oh, I'm sure they had buses, but we didn't ride them. <laughs> and, uh, and didn't think nothing about it, you know. That was a natural thing. And so, uh, as time when Omri down on Mound Street, we went to uh, the neighborhood center down there. I think the people was home. And it was the George homes, I think. And uh, I think the one, they're the one that had the car company. And uh, they were very nice people, very nice. And uh, I remember, oh yeah, that was a triangle down there, mm -hmm. North Washington Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, never forget Mr. Mosley, the tamale man. Mm -hmm. And he sold those hot tamales, I mean they were fabulous. <laughs> all over, all over Madison, the campus and everything. It was something. No one could make it like him. And um, Gerald, the daughter, she didn't, I don't think she didn't have time, but she didn't help out like just what her dad wanted her to. But uh, we lived downstairs from him, from his shop. And I would go down and help him out. There's a lot of, put the shelves on, put the cups on there. And uh, it was very interesting. So what was it like living in the Greenbush? You told me everyone that. knew each other. Yeah. They knew each other. It was like a big. Oh, yeah. everyone knew each other. Yeah. And there was your problem was our problem, and uh, they got along good. Got along real beautiful. Yeah. And anybody showed out, we wasn't sure that was taken care of. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it was good. Uh, remember the Trotters? They had their uh, tavern down West Washington Avenue. And 
next door to it was a shack, and that was uh, Italian. And uh, down for I'm trying to think that restaurant was the. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, I can't think the name right now. No. What was his name? It had come to me. But it was the black restaurant. And he, they did real well. In fact, oh, let me tell you this one. <laughs> um, my uncle, Carl Elvoy, he started a restaurant here. He was really good. Did real well. Now I have a sister that lived in Cleveland, Ohio. He, Uncle Carl, sent for her to help out in that restaurant, and it did very, very good. You know, as I was told, it was for my time. And um, there was Uncle Carl, and I don't know if you remember Mary Alice Smith, but anyway. Mary Alice, that's my cousin, first cousin, Al Boyd. And, um, and the Trotters, they had their tra tavern down there by the shack, too. And that was well known. And uh, Black Tavern. So did, did black people and Jews and Sicilians oh, yes, do things they, together? They, like I said, it was all family. Oh, uh, again, Mr. Senegal, Mr. Senegal. Now he was one of the old, old residents of the, of the Jewish people there. And uh, he, he owned a lot of property. And uh, like I said, everyone got along well. The Italians made their homemade wine, which was very good. <laughs> But like I said, uh, you know, it was it was a knit family. The Italians, the Jews, the blacks, name it. They all stuck together. So how did it feel when Urban Renewal forced you to break up that family? It was terrible. They didn't give them the money they should have gotten. It was a lot of crap about that. So I heard now. And, uh, but there wasn't much you could do about it, you know? You had to go along with the program, which they did. And, uh, it was, it was a good thing and a bad thing, you know? But, uh, you're going to survive regardless of what, what circumstances it is. All right. You know? <laughs> So there's a, a story or two, if we have time here, that you told me. Um, one was about going to hear Stan Kenton. Oh, gracious, yes. I love, <laughs> <laughs> I love my music. I love my music. i never forget, uh, I went there. It was downtown. I can't think of the name of that building. Because they always had live bands come to Madison. And uh, Stan Kenton was there just one day, one time. And uh, the guy I was with, George, he didn't very well dance, but he was not sure. <laughs> so it was Joe Moses, all the other group like, and a whole bunch of us. And oh, the music was just fantastic. Nobody was doing anything, they were just sitting down just listening. <laughs> you know, having their foot. And so, Roy Shelf, bless his heart. He said, Sarah, let's stand. I said, let's go. And <laughs> we got up and tore up that place. <laughs> the man came off that platform. He wanted our name. He wanted to sign us up to travel with them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I go. <laughs> I'll never forget that. 
banter. <laughs> they had the large live bands, and the Allisons, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Allison, they had their home, and they rented the homes out to those entertainers. To the black musicians who couldn't oh, stay in hotels. That's right, down. that's right. And, um, Do you remember any of those musicians? Well, uh, well Kevin Basie was here. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure if they have, but I do remember Kevin Basie. Can I represent the stand here for tributes or anything to do that? We'll do that at the end of the night. In the next event. So, uh, let's give a big hand to Sarah and thank you for hearing. for facilitating the next section uh, and let us end with love and appreciation. I call it Sister Sex. We like to now uh, uh, conduct the Joe McLean interview. And Joe McLean, well-known uh, person in our community, could not be here, so we've kind of flipped the script. We're going to ask you to be a part of this interview of Joe McClain. This is how I'm going to start it out. For those of us who know this young man, or have known this young man for more than 40 years, we call him radical, we call him respectful, and we call him righteous. So what we want to do at this point is go back to James Brown, son that he said. This is a man's work, but it wouldn't be nothing. Without, without a woman or a girl. This one has been with this man. Cheek to cheek, shoulder to shoulder, heart to heart, knee to knee, and ankle to ankle. Tied to him in the movement across the Dane County Madison uh, community. So I want to introduce her as my sister, and she'll be your sister after tonight. So stand and be recognized, and let us say, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, we pass you And we understand Joe's help will not allow him to be here. So having said that, what we want to do is now offer an opportunity for individuals to testify about this righteous, this radical, no, don't put your hand up. I'm going to one of the elders in the community to bring forth the first testimony. Reverend Barry, where you at? Over here. It's a privilege for me to say anything about Joe. Met Joe McLean 50 years ago. I just been discharged from the service. Got back from Vietnam and moved back to Milwaukee where my wife was. And while I was there, there was this group that began demonstrations in Milwaukee called the NAACP Youth Council, Commandos. And, and the Commandos were a militant group. And I looked at those guys and I said, I need to be a part of that. So I met a young man named Fred Reed that was a commando and I met, and he introduced me to Joe. Joe really became more like my father then. I'm a young fellow, 20 years old, He's older, had street wisdom, had discipline, and determination. And so he helped me advance into the commandos. I ended up becoming the secretary, but him and I, from that point on, became close friends. 265 days straight of marching and going to jail and crying and bleeding with each other. We watched that bill get passed, finally, that open housing bill in 68, and I think uh, poor Belle Phillips, every time she'd bring that bill before the Common Council, they'd vote it down, and she'd bring it, they'd vote it down, so we decided to put pressure on the city, and we marched. But most of the people that don't know the history of that Joe, some of the older commandos would ride cars skirting the march. 
purpose of the commandos were the security force for the marchers because the marchers were being attacked by the police so we decided we were going to put a stop to that and so we had security around the march and then on the outside of that security we had security and Joe and those wives or street wives <laughs> fellows were in part of that security it was really funny that one night we got arrested it where Joe went we got separated and on North Avenue there was an altercation with the police department and a bunch of us got arrested and one of the young men police had split his head and put him in the jail cell so we're all in a holding pen together and the kids bleeding all over the place the NAACP sent a lawyer down to bail us out so we went to court got bailed out we saw the judge and Judge Seraphim Anybody that's in Milwaukee knew Judge Seraphim, they, they, that was a radical. And so he looked at all of us, it was near Thanksgiving, he said, I don't want to see any one of you back in here again. When I do, you're going to go to jail. We went right back out that night, took the march across 16th Street Vida, met with all the people, got arrested again, back to the court. We knew we were going to Seraphim, so they Lawyers said file a petition of prejudice <laughs> against Seraphim, and we did, and they moved the case to another judge, and then he immediately told us, don't think we got away from it. <laughs> but the deal with Joe, Joe McClain was just, a, a, he had this, this hard surface. Um, he, he looked like a hard man, but he really had a soft heart. When you got to know Joe, he was really somebody. After all 40 years of not seeing, pretty close to 40 years of not seeing each other, because it's been 50 years, little did I know at the time that I would end up becoming a pastor, and Joe McClain would end up becoming a member of my church. And then I watched as his health kind of deteriorated, and I'd stop occasionally by the house and pick on Carol, and then Carol and the cat pick on me. But I wouldn't trade a single day of knowing Joe for all the money in the world. He was really, really, and still is, really somebody. Right. Pass the mic to Gwen Jones, and then I saw Ed said, raise your hand, and we'll come around and give you an opportunity to bring a little testimony. Good evening. Good evening. Reverend Barry knew one side of Joe McClain. I met another, another Joe McClain. When I was employed by American Family Insurance as the marketing director, I got a call one day from Joe McClain. I really didn't know Joe, and this is like 1990. But I took the meeting because I wanted to hear what he was talking about. And Joe came to out to Ampham, and I met with him, and I asked, well, what can I do for you? Because remember now, I'm community outreach. He says, I've got some kids that I want to teach to golf. Mm -hmm. I said, you do? He goes, yes. I said, what do you want me to do? I want you to sponsor us. I said, sponsor kids playing golf? Why did I even ask? <laughs> I learned Joe's passion, not only for the game of golf, but for our children. And when Joe left that day, I sat and pondered, and I'm like, I'm going to give him the money. Because he's doing something positive for these kids. From that point forward, for the next probably five, six years, I could count on Joe to call me when it was time to underwrite those kids. And he got the money every time. But I just could not... I really couldn't fathom his passion, because personally, I'm not a golfer, so I didn't get it from that perspective. But I got it from the youth perspective. And I was just so pleased that there was someone in the community who wanted to do something positive with these kids. And not only someone, but a man. <laughs> because so many of those kids, they needed a role model like Joe. And I was just so happy to help. And I've just been so proud to know him over the years. 
And I wish you were here today. Mm -hmm. Tell him I miss him. I will. Thank you. All right. If her is in Alabama, I gotta come up front. Come on, send that to the podium. <laughs> There's something to be said about uh, Brother Joe McLean and his beautiful wife. I've known Joe since I was a teenager. So you gotta understand, Val Phillips, uh, the Grappi, the NAACP, I grew up in Milwaukee at the time. And Brother Barry, mm -hmm. it was 200 times that they marched. 265. 265 later, but they documented 200. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're right, it was 265. The problem was fair housing. And Bell Phillips, for many years, was fighting to get that bill passed. Finally, they did. But uh, by that time, I'm in the military and gone. As a teenager, not only did the commandos take charge and be security for the marches, but they took charge in the community. You know, uh, you hear about the Black Panthers and all the stuff that they did. Well, the commandos did that and then so. Anything that went down in the community, you best believe if you was wrong, no, you got it. It wasn't about anything. There is a place called um, North Avenue and 7th Street. And at that area, my sister wrote this article. And the name of the article is called, I'm, uh, And My Steel Heart is Broken. How Milwaukee Civil Rights Bus Tour made uh, black history come alive for me. She actually, North Avenue, uh, I think it's on 4th and North Avenue. This is the Black Museum. And she took a bus tour of white folk and started looking at what the neighborhood did because remember when I was talking about housing? They took the Northwest Freeway and they tore up 8,000 homes right through the middle of the inner city. One block over, our house would have been involved in that. So from, I lived on 6th Street. So that Northwest Passway took a lot of brand new black homes that were built. And businesses went, and of course, you know, you know what gentrification is. However, I'm gonna pass this article around and let you guys read it. Thank you for your time. Right. Thank you. Uh, I was late, so I saw his hand move yeah, out. Sir. We'll have time for a few more after that. Yeah, uh, Mr. Banks. All right. Mr. Banks. Was there another hand? Can we have copies? Yeah, it's me. Yes, okay. And they make copies. Oh, she called him Banks. <laughs> no, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. What'd you say? I remember Joe. Last year, we went to the name dance. I set up chairs with Joe, I sat with him. So, Joe was very nice to me for helping me set up tables for dane dances. So I met his brother, Dennis. Cousin. Cousin. So Joe was, was proud of me for setting up for the dane dance. I sat with him and I had dinner with him. So, too bad that Joe wasn't here, and I knew he's going to be very, very happy for me. So, I'm going to miss you, Joey, because you should make, should make it. So, I'll, I'll you thank you for coming here for the Black History Month. And God bless you. Amen. One more, John Brown. Halfway. <laughs> you did have your hand up, didn't you? All right, you did. So over the years, I've worn a lot of hats. Hey, how you doing? Uh, back in 1994, after I left the Urban League, uh, there's a place called Somerset. Uh, it's now called Parker Place. 
Back in 94, Somerset was going crazy. The kids would gather there, 100, 200 kids, and there'd be fights breaking out. Um, a lot of intense poverty was going on. The, uh, the landlord, I think he ended up getting convicted of siphoning off funds from that project and doing something up in Alaska, I think. But anyhow, totally neglected the property, totally neglected the families who lived there. Uh, and so they got a hut grant. Uh, the, the Anchor Bank got a HUD grant, I don't know, $100,000 or whatever. Uh, I was brought on as the project evaluator and jack of all trades, so I ended up doing a lot of... Lamont Jones was oh, the yeah. uh, person who headed up the project, uh, Cephas Childs, and Madison Inner City Council of Substance Abuse did a lot of social services with the families. And then there was Joe. So Joe, I never know, when did Joe retire? Because I'm not sure if there's ever, I'm still trying to figure that one out. But, uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. So uh, Joe created a group called Arts on Prevention. And so he worked with the kids for about eight, nine months in Somerset. And we put on a big uh, block party, I think, uh, Labor Day weekend or something like that. But So he really involved all the kids. So there's all of a sudden this positive stuff that was going on in Somerset. They must have had 100, 150 kids involved, but he was just a kid. He was such a great person with the kids, uh, loved the kids, um, and really made a difference in their lives. I think the project was so good that they ended up selling the property <laughs> right after we got done with the project, and then it became Parker Place. But uh, Joe has always been down in the community, always had something going on, has always been active. Whether he got paid or not, Joe was still engaged in the community. Bless his heart. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I am so proud to know Joe McLean and Carol. They have been just treasures to my life personally. But in particular, um, I met Joe and Carol when my boys were involved with the Arts Art Prevention Program. <coughs> I was going through some rough times in my personal life and that program really helped me and helped them at the same time and mm -hmm. it really made a big impact on my boys' life today. They love Joe wherever they are in the world, country traveling or whatever, they always call and ask about Joe, call him from time to time or visit when they can. But Joe is a treasure to the Madison community, and so we're blessed to have him. Thank you, Carol. And Joe, when you give him a hug for us. We want to. How are everybody doing today? Uh, I've been doing, I'm 67 years old, so I've been doing Joe 67 years. Uh, I, got, I get to start out with a kid, and Joe is one of those relatives. Your sibling, my sibling, I always love to see. You know, he'd he come around once in a while. What, what happened, Joe was the type of person who didn't come around a lot. He'd always see he get himself in a little trouble back in the days <laughs> when I was a kid, you know what I'm saying? But my mother and Joe were so tight because my, my father and Joe are first cousins. So um, my mother met Joe before she met my father, so she got a lot of stories than I do. But anyway, uh, they were, grew up on Cherry Street, Walnut, in the whole area of Milwaukee, where uh, the first generation of black folks were living. And Joe was one of the type of person, he always took time out, even when he was a kid, to talk to us. You know, he's that type of, like, someone else you love to see. So he always funny, he always had stories, he always had stories of encouragement, stuff like that. So me and Joe, had been, as a relative, being living in Madison here, we just learned how to be so close, and, and uh, we talked so, so many things, uh, topics together, and, and he's been a, just a joy in my life uh, to this day. Matter of fact, I just left him. Uh, I brought Carol here, which is left here. So, me and Joe got a special relationship. And one relationship we do, I will say we have, we love to play Texas Hold'em poker. And, uh, <laughs> and sometimes me and Joe will sit down and walk and follow while we play a little Texas Hold'em poker. So, that sort of thing. But yeah, he's a, he's a fun guy to talk to, and um, I'm glad I'm still part of his life. I'll check on him as much as possible. I'll check on Carol, too. It's part of our elderly. I think it's very important that. You know any elderly in the community, please look after them. Please uh, take your time and, and share some love with them, visit them, be a companion to them, because they, they are so very important. Uh, yeah. uh, so I'm going to check that out. Uh, uh, they 
lot of people that we, we stand on their shoulders. And I know forget that. And I, that's why I appreciate so much of the LD that you guys are doing today. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Word from the family. You know, crazy word. And uh, let us conclude this portion before we move into the next session. So, um, we just have some tributes, please. And we're going to ask Carol to come up and receive the one for Joe McClain. And if you haven't signed it, please do. It's a tribute to Joe McClain in recognition of your lifetime of commitment as an activist in Milwaukee and Madison and in grateful appreciation of all your work on behalf of both communities. We thank you, we honor you, and we love you. Come on up, Carol. This time comes to Joe McClain. Before we put you in the hands of the service for like refreshments, uh, we want to bring forth some announcements. So for those of you who have upcoming announcements in the community, you have the opportunity to now let it be known to the community what's coming up. Now I'm aware of a few of them. So I'm going to take this microphone starting back here with the housing committee of the NAACP. And then I'm going to ask 100 back men to close us with a summary from the forum. And then we'll go to... Someone else had an announcement. Who was it? There. Okay. Yes. Good evening again. On behalf of the NAACP of Dane County, I would like to invite all of you to our housing forum that will be held on Saturday, February 29th, starting at noon. This forum is on fair housing as well as tenant rights. If you visit the NAACP website at www.naacpofdaneco.com There is a flyer out there and you click through and register. It is a free event. And the reason that we're doing this 
is because housing is a huge problem right now, especially for low-income families in Dane County. And there is a lot of there are a lot of things that people don't understand, especially with landlord tenant issues. We want to help bring that to light, let people get good answers from reputable people. Our speakers are going to include the director of Fair Lending or Fair Housing with the uh, Wisconsin Fair Housing Council. They'll be coming into Madison, they're out of Milwaukee. The Tenant Resource Center here in Dane County, as well as attorney David Spear, and he is an, an attorney locally that specializes in landlord <coughs> tenant law. We want people to have an opportunity to ask questions and get good answers. Okay. All right. Where at? It will be held at Madison College Goodman South Campus, second floor, in the community room. Starts at noon. Lunch <coughs> will be served. Yeah. Uh, so this is behind me. There you go. Hi. Uh, oh, yeah, I didn't expect an answer. This is Fan. Okay. Hey, Fan. So good to see you all. My name is J.R. Sims. I'm a vice president of 100 Black Men of Madison. Um, as uh, President Jones uh, alluded to earlier yesterday, no, day before yesterday, Day before yesterday, the 100 Black Men of Madison, um, in addition to its partners, or in conjunction with its partners, put on a candidate form for the school board. Now, if you remember what it was like on Monday, first of all, Monday was the day before the election. And so we put this thing together very hastily, simply because there had only been one form. And all elections are important. Oftentimes, folk who live in the community don't actually have access to questions and answers that these candidates um, uh, can provide. So, so it's been our it's been our experience that if we were to provide candidate forms in a location that other folk can easily get to it's just going to be very, very helpful. Because we believe, as we all believe, that voting is important, mm -hmm. democracy is important, but democracy only works when everybody participates. Mm -hmm. So we put on this form Monday. We've got all three school board candidates participating. On my way to the forum, of course, there was a snowstorm, mm -hmm. and it was really, really awful. Very, very bitterly cold. On my way to the forum, I was thinking, hmm, we may be lucky to get five people. Short notice, <clears throat> extremely bad weather. Well, we'll do what we can do. To my surprise, and a bit to my chagrin, mm -hmm. we had a full house. Wow. Front to back, wall to wall, top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Our panelists. President Jones was on our uh, panelists asking questions. Some of the questions were really poignant and really challenging, and the entire experience uh, was actually uplifting. Uh, the way everybody took part in being, of course, civil and, and respectful, but also asking hard questions and getting some very, very uh, thoughtful answers from our, from our candidates. We, the 100, we are nonpartisan. Everybody is treated fairly. That's the way we like to do it. But we just like to make certain that we have an opportunity to provide the best foot forward for the candidates who are going to be representing us. You need all the information that you can get. Uh, we finally cut the thing short. It started at uh, 6 o'clock, I believe. Uh, we finally pulled the plug at around 8. People still stuck around until like 940, 845 or so. So everybody was engaged. A good time was had by all. And um, the results of the election are the results of the election. And we're not done. Um, we've got more elections coming up. We will be certainly uh, staging more forms and you'll be getting emails, phone calls. It'll be in all of, all of your social media will be um, 
will be alerted. So uh, we hope to see many of you at our, our next candidate forum for whatever election that's going to be. Thank you so much. To tell me when there's an election coming up. Um, so there are 70 people here. If each one of you happened to talk to three people this week and every week between now and April, do you know how many people you would be talking to as a group? You would deal with how many? I said if every one of you here talked to maybe three people at the grocery store or whatever between now and April, and most of the, a lot of these are young voters who are not either registered or haven't voted. So this is your opportunity. If three, if all the 70 people talk to three people between now and April, that's a lot of vote turnout voters. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that public service announcement, Peggy. I want to do two quick things and then uh, release you so that you can have some refreshments. First of all, I want to introduce this planning committee. So those of you who are here, we do have one member who said, I call your name, please stand or at least wave the crowd. First person on the list is Fabu uh, Phyllis Carter. You met her earlier, Pia Kenny James is sitting here. I'm Greg Jones, Margaret Nellis, who uh, is ill and couldn't be here, Donna Page, Kimberly William, and Peggy. That was Peggy who talked about voter registration. So please give them a round of hands. I just want to reflect on uh, this is the third of four events that we're having at this facility. The first week, we recognized our black artists. They were here. Last week, we recognized those individuals who provide good food for the soul. Robert Pierce talked about farming, and uh, our gracious cook tonight, uh, Ruthie, talked about preparing the food tonight with the elders. Next week, we're going to talk about the African American history of Madison. That's a very interesting show, so please come back to that. So I want to do that to let you know what we've done, where we're going. But more than anything else, as a backdrop to this room, for the four months of February, we posted Umoja covers from over two, maybe two and a half decades. So when you get a chance, we walk around, remind yourselves about these covers to Umoja magazine that have been published and out there. So we're so gracious to Malayla for allowing us to use them, as well as the Urban League. What did I forget? Donna Page. Donna Page. Did I call her Donna's name? Yeah. Okay, Donna. And she's that way the next crowd. So having said that, we need for you to fill out your evaluations. And I'm going to tell you this now. You can't eat till you fill them out. Turn them <laughs> Remember when you were in third grade? <laughs> so please fill out those emails. The library needs them to know about utilization, this room, and it also can help have funding requests. So please fill them out. I'm glad to see you. When did you come in? Okay, uh, yes. The event title is the uh, Black History Month Tribute to Elders. Okay, so now you're now in the hands of the service. As I understand, they want you to exit this side to the food table and back around into this room. Yes, and they will collect those uh, emails at the table. All right. I uh, like this. Everybody talks about Joe from their own perspective. So I just want to end this by saying Joe McLean was a Wisconsin State employee. Mm -hmm. That means he was a bureaucrat. Bureaucrats think differently than other people. We have to think logically. I say we, because I'm one too. We have to think logically and we ask a whole lot of questions. But this is what he transformed the Wisconsin State government to do. We developed an organization called the Wisconsin Association of Black State Employees. That organization was designed because of our elders like Joe understanding the need to mentor, train, and include young blacks as they came in state service. That in itself had a lot to do with retaining folk like myself for 35 years in state government. So let us end this by saying, while Joe, you're not here, know that we love you. Everybody who can stand, stand. Give them a round of applause. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Let's give both Sarah Wells and Bill McLean another big round of applause, please.